Hey, Jay, how you doing today? Good, Dave. How are you? Doing well. Well, thanks again for uh, for having a chat with me. I, I enjoyed the first one, so let's try this one. Let's do it again. Okay, so the last time uh, we spoke, we talked about uh, you learning to play basketball as a kid and all that your dad did for you. And then we, we yeah. talked about your Morgantown High career. And then we moved on to West Virginia University and some stories there. And then I think the last thing you had to say is we were going to make a segue into your uh, school administration career. Is that right? Well, we could. That's a, that's a good way to start. That's another segment of my life and my career. So we can begin there. Let's, let's do that. So after you left WVU as a basketball player and a student, what happened? Well, uh, the assistant coach of West Virginia, George King, uh, found sort of took a liking to me when I was in school. And he said, hey, there's a job opportunity. I just got a call from Benwood Union High School right in south, south of Wheeling, West Virginia. And uh, we were wondering if uh, you might be interested. And I said, yeah, I'd be glad to. I was running the swimming pool in Morgantown and uh, I was managing there and I said, uh, well, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, these people will get back to you. So uh, all of a sudden I was out there working one day, day and a man came down named Cheryl Wilson and he was assistant superintendent of schools. And he said, uh, he talked to me a while, great guy. And he said to me, he said, uh, would you be interested in talking to us about the opening of basketball at Benwood Union High School in Marshall County? And I said, sure. Yeah, so this, my is, wife, this is to do coaching? Yes, this would be as a head coach. Okay. So when I met with him, the job consisted of uh, head basketball coach and baseball coach. Really? And those did everything. And the ninth grade coach in football, I knew nothing to be damned. I knew very little about basketball. But wow, football I knew nothing about. What about and baseball? Base baseball I knew a little bit about. Okay. So uh, they liked my ideas and thoughts on the basketball. So they hired me uh, as an English teacher and the ninth grade football coach. So I went in with uh, the head football coach, a guy by the name of Fred Tweedley, and I started with him. He tried to teach me the ropes, but the ninth grade team we had was very poor. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. In fact, we never even got over the 50 yard line in seven games. <laughs> wow. So finally, in the eighth grade, in the, in the eighth game of the season, uh, our team ran, got in over to the 47 yard line. You should have seen our bench. It was like uh, New Year's Eve in Times Square. I mean, they were so happy we had done that. But we had a, a season that we didn't win a game. So then I went into the basketball season. And I think what they liked about my philosophy was, Dave, that uh, I had had the zone presses. And that's what I wanted to do. But I realized very quickly, I might have had the zone presses. I might have had some knowledge. But number one, I was inheriting four players from the previous coach. And that's not easy when you take that. And so I was new. I was trying to do that, and I was trying to force my will upon these players that I had right. the answer for everything, philosophy-wise, uh, fundamental-wise, and everything else. Well, it took maybe halfway through the season till we finally started to click, and uh, then we won a bunch of games at the end. We got into the West Virginia State Tournament. Well, there was a funny thing story that happened to me in the state tournament. Uh, we were playing in the regional championship. And I felt as a coach, I was pretty, uh, I'd say I was pretty erratic and uh, I thought I knew everything. So I thought we were getting bad calls. So when he came down the sideline one time, I'd, I'd had a couple of good arguments with him, but this was the last straw. I took my sport coat off and threw it over his head. And so uh, that wasn't good. Not only did we lose the game, but uh, I was suspended a couple of games at the really? beginning of the next season. Yeah. So and so, go ahead. So when when this happened and you immediately realized that you kind of stepped in it, uh, what was the reaction from your players? Uh, well, they loved it. Uh, there sure. wasn't any problem yeah. with that because they felt the same way I did. Yep. But I had one more incident before that, so this is what put the 
uh, icing on the cake. We were playing a game against Tridelphia High School, a school outside of Wheeling. And uh, again, I was erratic and thought I knew everything and the officials were wrong, which I grew knew through my career in broadcasting. That's just not true. They're right. just doing their job and I'm trying to do mine. But we had beaten this team so bad, Dave, at home. So we go up to Tridelphia and I've never seen these officials before. And it, it really was uh, probably a hose job at its finest. Uh, mm -hmm. They brought the officials in and uh, they, we were getting all calls against it. We, we spread out, we didn't even have anybody in the lane. They were calling us three seconds. So finally in the third quarter, we were down about 15. So I came over and I said to our team, I said, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go into a two-two zone and you, Mike Tribbett, I want you to come out. And I want you to guard that one official over there on the left-hand side. I want you to face guard him to start the whole th fourth quarter. I want you to get in his face so he can't see anything. It's like you're guarding a man. And he was, Mike was quick. And he said, okay. And I said, remember now, you're a junior and you want to play next year. You got to do this. So, uh, so you had him guard the official? Yeah, I had him guard the official. And because I knew I, I knew we were going to have a hard time, so the official was really struggling. So he hit me with one technical, thought that would settle it down. So Mike came over and said, what do you want me to do? I'm sort of liking this, Coach. I said, well, let's just keep it up because we're down 17 now. So uh, we came out on the floor, and, boy, he was great. Nobody did it like him. I mean, he just got in that referee's face. Finally, it ended up in double technical, me out of the game, and once again suspended. So I was sort of a, a crazy man as a coach and uh, it just wasn't good for the game. And it certainly wasn't a good reflection on me. So those two things happened. Uh, you know, that those are good stories. Sometimes uh, great coaches do some crazy things though. It, it has been known to happen. What happened was one day during, they had a big parade in Wheeling, West Virginia. And uh, during Thanksgiving, well, our band director, I knew pretty well, and his son was playing for me on the team. He came down to me one day and he said, Jay, I got a problem. I can't march in a parade and our, our families here and everybody in the community wants to make sure that, that we're in the parade. So uh, I said, well, how can I help you? And he said, well, I'd like to put some uniforms on some of your players. Now, all they need to do, I'll teach them how to line up in the parade, but I want them to go down in the parade not play anything, just fake the instruments. And he said, can I borrow about 20 of your guys? I said, if they'll do it, I'm all for it. <laughs> so uh, he talked to the players, I talked to the players and, and we decided to do it. I'm telling you what, Dave, they were so good. I mean, <laughs> one guy had drums, another guy had a trumpet and that kid was like you to blowing his brains out. I mean, the way he was going down there, faking everything. And I mean, the people were cheering and yelling and loved us in the parade. And we marched about 70 that day. And there was only about 45 in, the, in, the, in his band. He didn't have enough in his band to do it. But with our 25, the JV and the varsity team, they did a good job. We had a lot of fun that day. <laughs> you guys were good entertainers. Oh, we must have been because the people really liked it. Well, later when I told everybody what happened, they couldn't believe it. They said, my golly. And we had this one guy, uh, Elijah Hill was his name. He was so good with that trumpet. You'd have thought that uh, it was Marcellus. I mean, he you was, thought he was yeah. Al Hurt so good. The best fake trumpet player in all of West yeah. Virginia. Yeah. Yes, you're right. The yeah. best fake trumpet player. Yeah. He was really <laughs> Nothing was coming out. The drum guy was good, too. He was never hitting the drums, but you thought it, he was beating the heck out of them. How long did you coach in that particular school? Well, I was there until about 19, I believe, 68. Okay. And uh, Mr. Wilson, the guy that originally hired me out of Morgantown to start this, came to me one day and said, we're consolidating your school and two other schools into one school. And we decided as the Board of Education, any of the coaches that were coaching in that county then were not going to be, uh, were not going to be hired as a basketball coach. Well, I, I wanted to coach basketball. I was in love with the game. I had done it all my life. And so I appreciate him doing that. But he said, we want to give you the head baseball job. And mm -hmm. I said, well, I had an incident the year before and uh, on the baseball field when we were playing somebody. And uh, I said, what about that incident? He said, oh, that was the funniest thing that ever happened. 
I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. <laughs> he said, I was at that game when you did that. And what happened was the game was tied and we had a little kid named Joey Tomlinson and he hit a ball right up the gap day, right between right and center field, rolled all the way to the fence. Good so spot. he's rounding first, hits second base. I wave him over. I'm coaching third. I wave him over to third. He comes into third and he slides in and the umpire from home plate comes up to third base to make the call. And uh, he was a priest down at the parish in Moundsville. Uh huh. So he comes up the third base line to make the call and, and Joey Tomlinson slides into third. And uh, he said, you're out. And I said, but father, he's a good Catholic. And he said, he's in there. He's in there. He's safe. He's safe. He changed the call because he was a Catholic. And uh, I started going to church then a lot more. So, <laughs> so anyway, but that was the end of the fourth year. And Dave, what happened to me? He said, I will offer you the baseball job. And I said, I didn't want to do that. And so then I started applying for jobs. And it's a funny story because in our first segment on here, I talked about going to Morgantown High and right. doing some coaching. Well, I took with Jack Roberts, the head coach, we took a team to the state tournament. But in the regional final, we played a team from Martinsburg and we ended up beating them to go to the state. And that coach then went to Frederick, Maryland as the director of physical education for the county. And he mm -hmm. remembered me from a couple of years ago. And so he called me even not knowing what was going on in Marshall County, West Virginia, he called me and said, Hey, would you like to interview for the job? And uh, we have a job opening at a big high school, with 3000 kids down here. And we'd like to have you interview. And I thought it was perfect timing for me. So I went down and did the interview and ended up getting the job. So I moved to Frederick County, my wife and I, and we adopted our first child. Uh, from a, uh, the diocese in Wheeling, West Virginia. And so we brought Lisa along. And uh, so that started our that started our role from there into there. And eventually I coached there for four or five years and then went into administration, Dave, in that area and in that school system. So after a few years in the administration there, what, what ended up happening that got you pointed back towards, uh, I mean, I guess not back towards, but for the first time you got into radio somehow? Yeah, I did. Uh, that's a unique story. And uh, I had retired. I took the administration job and the athletic directorship at this school. So then there, were, there was this guy named Joe Rizzo, and he worked at the cable company, Dave, in mm -hmm. Frederick. But he had such great vision. And he said, he came to me and he said, I'm looking for an analyst, a guy that can come on with a with a play by play guy. And what we will do, we want every Friday night, we want to tape a game, just tape it, video it, tape it and use it in Cumberland, Maryland, Hagerstown, Maryland, Frederick, Maryland and Annapolis. Would you be interested in, in doing this? So uh, I said, yeah, well, the first year. Uh, we did about 15 games. Then it came back in the third game of the second year. I got a call after a game that we had done in Hagerstown. And it was a guy by the name of Paul Miller, who was the assistant athletic director, associate athletic director at West Virginia. And, he, and I knew Paul. And he said to me, Jay, would you be interested in, do you have any tapes of, your, of these games you've been doing? Because I'm sitting in a hotel and in Hagerstown and I'm getting ready to leave but I'm looking at this game that you did from last night would you have a tape that you could send me and I said Paul I don't know if I can do this he said you can do it he said I liked your work you can do it so I sent him the tape and uh, maybe two months later he called me and said we're putting a network together it's called the West Virginia Television Network this would have been 1974 and he said, uh, I'd, I'd love to have you join a guy by the name of Woody O'Hara and sure. have him, yeah, have him do the games with you. Jack will stay on the radio, Jack Fleming. Right. Well, uh, that's how it all started. And then Paul, Paul Miller ended up after maybe three years. Now we're about 75. I remember Hubs is a senior. 
and uh, really? he's in the program as a player. Yeah. And he said, and uh, so they said to me, look, uh, I, Paul called me and said, look, I'm giving this up. I'm giving it to a guy named Mike Parsons. And uh, he said, he's going to take it over. Well, eventually what Mike did, Mike went over and uh, just grabbed it and really did the thing with it. And that was the beginning of Mountaineer Sports Network. As you guys know, it is MSN and it carried on for a long time. But Paul, uh, Paul gave it to Mike and Mike was really good at this and terrific. And he had high expectations of what he wanted. And he taught me a lot about it. And so I ended up, and because of that, I ended up working with a guy named Bray Carey at Creative Sports Marketing out of Charlotte. And so he put me on the old Sunbelt games. So I was getting a lot of work at that time in TV, but I was still a assistant principal in a school. Wow. I didn't realize you did the same, uh, that you did both jobs yeah. at the same time. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, I did. And did you start off doing, were you ever play by play or were you like color? No, I was always an analyst through the whole thing. Yeah. And yeah. it really helped me. But these guys taught me so much about when to say it, when to talk, when not sure. to talk, and the difference between radio and TV. And I learned that over hard work because it took a lot to do it. But I, I got through where I knew what I, I knew what an analyzation, I know what I was supposed to do. And, and TV, Dave, you talk more as an analyst than you do on the radio as an analyst because mm -hmm. on TV, you have to do the replays and you're looking at a game right. on TV and the analyst is trying to explain what you're seeing. The play-by-play -play guy is solid. You've got to have a good one because he can work with you and give you the right steps. And that's how that all started. And I continued and I, Mike Parsons was one of the big characters in that. I read somewhere when I was uh, before we started our interviews that you take a, a, a whole lot of notes. You do like player by player notes when you work. Yeah, I do. I have a chart. And uh, I think one thing that uh, Jack Fleming taught me because mm -hmm. I joined him in radio in 96 and uh, before he moved, he had a heart problem and he ended up uh, just they had to move on from him. And that was a sad day because Jack was a, a he, hell of an actor. He was a legend. And, yeah. He really is. And uh, he didn't take a liking to me at first, but he okayed it because when I come after the job and I'm jumping sidebar and on you a little bit here, but I want to get this point in that I would never have joined Jack strictly on radio. And Mike Parson was the guy that mediated this. And I said to Mike one day when he called me and asked me to do this, he said, I know you're still working. Are you ready to retire from administration? And I said, yeah, I probably could do, depending on what the contract is. He said, well, here, where, here's what I want. And he explained to me, I want a guy on to help Jack. I said, whoa, Mike, hold on a minute. I'm not doing anything unless Jack approves. Sure. I'm just not going to do it. So they ended up, I don't know how they appeased him, but I know this was one of the things that when I took it, what we did was we took a half and a half. Woody O'Hara was still in the mix. Mm -hmm. So he would do the first half on TV with me. I would stay on TV. Jack would come from radio down to, down to the TV for the second half. Really? We worked out until we got down to Virginia Tech. Okay. And we saw the radio facility was way up at the top of Castle Coliseum. So Jack said, hey, I'm, I'm calling the shot here. The three of us are going over and we're going to time it from me leaving radio, Woody, Woody leaving TV, and we're going to cross each other and I get down in time for the second half. So he was going so to physically run down there. Well, he was going to have to. Yeah, yeah. that's how he, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we timed it and we made it. And boy, we were all excited because we made about a minute. The only thing we didn't count in was the 10,000 people in the crowd that night. So we let... Woody had no problem. He got up and left and he just left me there. Well, then I say, there's no Jack. Where's Jack? Where in the hell is Jack? He's not here. So I look up in the crowd. He's trying to get through the crowd to get down. So I pick up my headset and I put it on and I go, Nick. And it was Nick Smith out in the truck. I said, Nick, Jack's not here. He said, I can't help you, Jay. Five, uh -oh. four, three, two, one. So there I was. And that what started the 
preparing for for games. I didn't have a good prep sheet then. And so I picked up a sheet that I had. It was the Virginia Tech dance team Uh and all their names and numbers. So I described that, which didn't go over too good. West Virginia people weren't happy with that because we were dividing and splitting the game. And we were doing it back to the Virginia Tech fans. But that tempted me from that point then. I knew that every time I had to have a sheet of every player and everything that was going on. So to this day, I still have a prep sheet. Nothing like learning on the air, right? <laughs> that's right. Boy, that, that's true. It's, not, it's a little bit funny now, but it really wasn't fun. I was scared to death. I believe I it. So, so this, uh, you had been calling Mountaineer games and doing television for a while, and then they brought you in to work with Jack specifically? Yeah. What happened was that uh, they kept Woody on the TV and Jack and I did the games and Jack was becoming uh, and not as well. And I helped him a lot. He was just sometimes not giving the score, but they didn't want to take, and I agreed 100%. I said, let's don't take away from Jack and all those years and how great he was. Let's make right. sure that he's still the kingpin and if he's still the number one guy. So we worked hard at that. And Mike Parson was, Parsons was very instrumental. And a guy named Dale Miller, who ran the network with all the stations in West Virginia. And he was the guy that really worked with uh, Mike Parsons on this. And so we ha- had it all happen. And eventually it led into Jack just giving it up and Tony coming on the scene. So, at, so when Jack Fleming was having some trouble with his health, you said, uh, yeah. Tony Caridi stepped in. Well, that was a pretty unique thing. Uh, we were in New York in the garden and we we're going to play Rhode Island on Saturday and Friday night, Jack's blood pressure went very high and it went, uh, it went up real, real high mm-hmm. so that he, it was impossible for him to, uh, to work, uh, to work any games because of the fact that uh, uh, he just he just wasn't capable of doing it. Sure. So Tony was in Morgantown, Dave, and so Mike Parsons, sharp guy, as I said earlier, just picked up the phone and called Tony and brought Tony into New York that night. So then he made a decision to give the radio to Woody for that whole game, and Tony and I stayed on and did the TV from the Garden that day against Rhode Island. And from then on, we've been partners. What was your first impressions of Tony? Uh, Tony, I, and even now, Tony is a very professional, Dave. Number two, he's organized. Number three, he his expectations are high. Mm-hmm. And he expects everybody around him. He doesn't want a bad broadcast. Sure. And even though sometimes we have them, He doesn't strive for that. He doesn't take him in stride. And so those are good things that they have in him. And he he knows this business and he knows the engineering end of it. So he could engineer a game, although we have engineer that travels with us all the time in football and basketball. But no, I think he had all those qualifications and it made it very good. And I accepted, I knew my role with Tony was going to be, uh, I, I was going to be second. I was never, ever going to, and, and you shouldn't be. As an analyst, you're not the lead guy. You're sure. the second guy. So I ended up being just a sidekick with a jibber jabber mouth. And so that's how it ended up being. And uh, so far, we've been very compatible doing it. It's worked out pretty well, yeah? Yeah, it has. It really has. All right, good. Well, I think with us transitioning into your years with Tony, that's, yeah. a, that's a good place to stop for here and say goodbye. And then next time we'll pick it up and we'll get back into the John Beeline years. And then we'll, we'll start talking about some modern era Bob Huggins basketball. That'll be great, Dave. Thank you. That sounds excellent. All right, Jay. Well, thanks a bunch. Yeah. See ya. All right. See ya.